Happy Friday, Baylor College of Medicine and friends of Baylor. Oh, notice the point. We're, we're very lucky today to have two of my favorite people. Dr. Hudi Zagbi is the director of the Dan and Dan Duncan uh, Neurologic Research Institute and professor of genetics here at Baylor. She is a fantastic physician scientist and who's been a neurogeneticist, really transformed the entire field. And um, she's got some wonderful stories and about the research that she's doing. But more importantly, all that's all well and good. Oh, oh by the way, Howard Hughes investigator and won the breakthrough prize, but that's not important. What is important is she makes the best hummus. Not even, not even close. I mean, all, I've traveled the world, and you make the best hummus. And that is the most important thing. And, of course, Carolyn Smith, the professor of molecular and cell biology, who studies the molecular pharmacology of estrogen receptors and other co-activators. She has many titles. She holds multiple leadership roles here, including the senior vice president and dean of research, as well as being the lucky person who gets the dean of the graduate school, which has gone through many years of reorganization, organization, and reorganization. So thank you both. Uh, I thought it'd be really fun for our viewers today to get a sense of kind of the what's going on in science, how you do it, and what the enterprise is like at Baylor College of Medicine. So, Huda, I want to start with you. You, you really started off becoming famous. I'm quite excited to tell you about the discovery of the gene that causes Rett syndrome. This finding is the result of years of collaboration between my laboratory and that of Dr. Uta Frank at Stanford. over your discovery of Rett syndrome or the molecular basis of Rett syndrome. Just tell us a little bit about your personal story and how mentorship and support played a role in your, in your career. First of all, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank, well, thank you, you for having much. me today. <laughs> um, so I started my career as a pediatrician and I wanted to become a pediatric neurologist and was intending to be a full-time physician, but encountering patients with Rett syndrome really stole my heart and broke my heart because it's a devastating disease to be healthy and lose every skill and have every neurologic symptom in one person. And I decided the only way to help them is through research. I have to become a scientist to figure out the cause to help. But I was clueless about science, and this is where mentorship is important. I found a mentor, Dr. Arthur Boudet, to take me in his lab, willing to teach me how to do molecular genetics, how to do genetic engineering. With sure. great mentorship, although it took a while, because Rett syndrome was a tough nut to crack, it took a while I was able to find the cause. And what's amazing is this one rare disease, by finding the gene, we learned so much, and it opened really the path to start understanding the more common form of autism, in that you can have a mutation in a child that in neither parent. That's the first thing we learn, and now there are hundreds of genes that cause autism and intellectual disabilities. Okay. <laughs> the second thing we learn from this disease is really that proteins can cause disease either by being too little or too much. We studied those diseases, and I'm happy to say all that research has led to clinical trials for these disorders That's great. now. And you know, you mentioned Dr. Baudet, who was the mm -hmm. chairman of genetics. A lot of times scientists uh, have an individual kind of mentor who makes a difference. I think our institution's a little bit different. We've tried to create an environment that mm -hmm. uh, really fosters uh, science, and that's a lot of uh, what Dr. Smith's responsibility is. So can you talk a little bit about what we do at Baylor to try and help uh, scientists like do the kinds of discovery science that uh, Dr. Gazagby does? Yeah, we do a lot to um, bring together faculty and pair them up with people. So an example would be how we work with our trainees. When we bring students into our PhD programs, we uh, allow them and encourage them to work for short periods of time in a number of different laboratories. So they get to learn different people doing science, how they do science, um, and let them find that mentor that really works with them and will be there to guide them through their development. We do other things, though, that support our faculty in terms of mentorship. So we, um, we bring together groups of investigators and centers so that they have a common focus. And um, they maybe have a specific interest in a disease that they share amongst them, but they'll approach it from different perspectives so that they can work together, learn from each other, and really help advance that area of science um, to really 
make that environment supportive and let them get to the next level as quickly as possible. I do think our institution is different from many because uh, I do think our environment really supports young investigators to be, you know, be able to do whatever they want. Uh, one of the biggest misconceptions that people who are not scientists themselves think about it or have is that, you know, you discover something like we, you were mentioning Rett syndrome. Uh, well, and you're working on therapeutics. If you discover something, and why why isn't there a therapeutic that develops right away? And you know we're doing all this science, but it seems like it takes long. But so, for example, you're recently working on Alzheimer's and other degenerative diseases. What's the timeline for finding something that's really intriguing in a laboratory and actually getting it to the point where it has an effect in people? Absolutely. So the journey from a discovery of a cause all the way to treatment is complicated and requires deep understanding of the disease, modeling the disease either in human cells or in mice, testing new treatments, and then eventually proving time and time again, I've been through it and we got that into a clinical trial. It takes anywhere from 15 years sometimes to 20 years. Thankfully, new technology is accelerating that and I'm excited to share with you about the work on Alzheimer's disease. We've learned quite a bit about some of the big drivers of Alzheimer. Tau is one of the drivers of 26 different dementia. To amplify what Dr. Smith said, the environment at Baylor, the collaborative environment, led me to work with a team of scientists, Dr. Bellin, Dr. Botas, Dr. Ramahi. We all work together. We've been working together for 12 to 15 years to find different ways in the whole genome to regulate tame that tau protein that drives so many dementia. And we discovered them. We discovered pathways that actually can lower that protein if you inhibit them. So you go from that pathway now to making small molecule. We're working together on a small molecule that can lower tau, which means if somebody has a parent with Alzheimer, or somebody has a genotype, APOE4, they can take this hopefully to prevent. So I'm excited to say that those 12 to 15 years we invested were in the last few steps, I hope, to come up with something very exciting that's really Baylor-born and Baylor-driven to get us to this point. But I do want to emphasize 12 to 15 years of science to get to the point where we're beginning to have a yes. therapeutic. Yes. That's something that people don't really realize. Right. It may take 15 to 20 years before you discover something and have a therapeutic. And I would like to add one Perhaps. thing really cool. Normally, the, those 15 years would have gotten us to a place that will take us another 15 years to have the drug. But I have to tell you, with the AI, with the team, Dr. Lu and others, with the AI uh, technology we have at our at our hand and alpha fold and other things we put together, we were able to accelerate the discovery of potential small molecules. And we're now working with Damien and Young to even and make them better. Yeah, maybe so it's it won't a be 20 years, village. it'll only be 10 years. Yes, <laughs> well, I'm hoping even it's five. It's not gonna be a week. I'm, I'm hoping for <laughs> Everybody wants it like next week. It's really exciting. So, so you mentioned uh, some of the stuff at Baylor and Dr. Smith, maybe you could just give people an idea of the sort of the size of what we do the, the, as an institution what kind of, how big is our research institution? How many labs are there? What kind of stuff are, you know, just how big is it? Yeah, we're, well, we're pretty big. We're, um, we're the 20th ranked institution in the country for funding from the NIH. And what that means here at the college is we've got, um, probably about a thousand faculty doing research of different types. We've got 500 postdoctoral fellows. 600 graduate students, technicians and staff. We have a lot of people coming together to work on these really important problems. Some of them are working directly on the disease. Some of them are working in support services that really help accelerate. Some of the things that Dr. Zogby mentioned, being able to use artificial intelligence to really advance quickly and get um, partners in drug discovery to work with her team um, really help move things forward. But it's, it's really a large enterprise and it requires a lot of people to work together. Yeah, and you mentioned uh, the NIH funding, and a lot of what we do, actually most of what we do is funded entirely through federal sources and other foundations and state money. But for really interesting novel approaches, a lot of times you have to use other ways. And, and I know, who do you've been terrific at raising funds, so maybe you could talk about the importance that philanthropy plays because it really is a partnership with the community. Absolutely. Anytime you want to break a new path, make a big discovery, take a risk to solve a big challenge, 
we need philanthropy. And as you know, the Duncan Neurological Research Institute, all the faculty are Baylor faculty. To bring all these faculty, we brought 35 faculty, every one of them brilliant. We're competing with the top institutions. We need philanthropy to bring them here. And having them here collectively is what got us to this point where we're making the discovery. So we need them to make new exciting discovery, chart new path, and bring the best talent. Yeah, and to you, Texas. you mentioned, I mean, it is really a talent pool and trainees and young faculty that drive a lot of the discovery science. Uh, you are, <laughs> Dr. Smith, you're responsible for the graduate school mm -hmm. and all these tr young uh, training scientists. Uh, maybe you could talk a little bit about them and, and maybe also talk about, it. I'd be interested in. I should have asked you this before, but what's the mood right now? I mean, it's very tough right now out there in, science, in, in the science world. You know, how are we keeping our graduate students and how are they feeling? Yeah. So, um, you know, I think it's a, it's a great pleasure to be able to bring young people into science here at the college. We have an application process that really spans across the globe. So we bring in the best students from the United States all across the country, but we also bring in the best students from across the year, uh, across the globe. So we have people that have been working their whole life for a chance to get into a, a really great research environment. We really select people carefully. We bring people in that have a lot of different perspectives and talents and then our job is to sort of nurture them and to help them grow into really critical um, and successful students. Um, I would say the mood in a lot of ways is very optimistic. We have uh, a really talented pool of people that um, do great work while they're here as students and then go on into other academic institutions and they go into companies that help develop technologies and bring new products in. Um, it is a, also a time where there's a lot of uh, concern about what the long-term future looks like and so we're trying to help all of our students be prepared to be able to navigate whatever the future brings for us and that's one of the approaches I think that um, allows them to really um, move forward with a lot of motivation to do the work um, that they do so well while they're here. Well, thank you. I mean, this is, you can see why it's great to be here. I mean, we have fabulous science, cutting edge. We have a wonderful environment, fantastic leadership. I want to thank you both for taking the time. Uh, people will really enjoy hearing a little bit more about the science that goes on here at Baylor College of Medicine. So thank you both. Uh, thanks for taking the time. Thank you. Thank you. I want to end today with a couple of shout outs. First of all, congratulations to the physicians and staff in our Baylor Medicine Clinics in the Department of Family Medicine, Internal Medicine, and Surgery for earning multiple American Heart Association awards. These clinics were honored for their excellence in diabetes, cholesterol, and blood pressure control. So congratulations. Also, congratulations to Dr. Hooley, Assistant Professor of Pediatrics, who's been appointed to the Harris Health Board by Commissioner Leslie Briones for a two-year term. Board members are responsible for governance, financial stewardship, and the strategic direction for the Harris Health System, which is our Houston, our, our Houston Harris County Safety Net Hospital System. Uh, this week, the voters passed a Texas uh, constitutional amendment to establish the Dementia Prevention Research Institute of Texas that will support research in the prevention and treatment of dementia related to uh, neurodegeneration, but Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease. This is really forward thinking. Uh, they're doing something very similar to uh, what they did with called CPRIT, which is the Cancer Prevention Research Institute of Texas. And this will allow Texas uh, to fund science in that area and also recruit outstanding neuroscientists. So that's a big deal, and the Texas voters approved it. And then finally, Tuesday is Veterans Day when we honor and thank all those who served in the U.S. military. We have many veterans at Baylor among our faculty, staff, and trainees whose military experience provides tremendous value uh, in their work in all our mission areas. Baylor is also privileged to be providing care for the veterans at the Michael DeBakey VA Hospital, one of the largest and best VA hospitals in the country. Baylor was the very first academic institution to affiliate with the VA, and we've been proud affiliates since the end of World War II. Anyway, have a wonderful weekend, and I can't wait to see you next week. <laughs>